You're listening to the SSPX Podcast, and welcome to episode 31 of the Crisis in the Church series. Today, we'll start with the first of two episodes with Father Paul Robinson about the doctrine, Outside the Church, There is No Salvation. And today, we'll be speaking about Father Leonard Feeney and the organizations that he was a part of, the St. Benedict Center and the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart. Why discuss this doctrine and this movement, commonly known as Feeneyism, during this point in the Crisis in the Church series? Well, because this movement, which started before the Second Vatican Council started, contains stark warnings about the current traditional movement in the 21st century. If you'd like to learn more about the series we're doing on the Crisis in the Church, or go back and revisit our previous 30 episodes, or if you want to support this project, please visit sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Now, we'll turn to our conversation with Father Robinson. Well, welcome back to the SSPX Podcast in our next episode on the Crisis in the Church series, joined by Father Paul Robinson from St. Isidore's in Denver, Colorado. Hello, Father. How are you? Hello, Andrew. I'm doing fine. Great, great. Well, today we are talking about uh, Feneyism, uh, which is something that popped up in the mid, mid part of the 20th century. Uh, and this is a little bit different from some of the other topics that we've talked about in terms of, well, this is more of a traditional error or a, or a conservative error, I guess we could say. It, it went too far yes. to the conservative side of things, as opposed to many of the other things we've been talking about, which are uh, errors too far on, on the liberal side of things or modernist side of things. So uh, what yes. is Feneyism and why are we talking about it today, Father? Well, um, let, let me just say, first of all, that uh, this is um, a, a topic that hits close to home for me because I, I actually grew up in an independent chapel in Kentucky um, that was first serviced by Father Wathen, um, who uh, was a Feneyite, what is called a Feneyite, um, or a follower of the specific idea of Father Leonard Feeney. Um, and then my father, Bitzer, uh, who was also a Feneyite. So, so this, uh, I've got a bit of a track record <laughs> with this particular topic. Um, and well, um, w- how does it connect to the, to the Christ in the church series? I, I think what we have to understand with Feneyism is that Father Leonard Feeney was reacting to some uh, bad theology before the council. Um, this ecumenism that was uh, up and coming in the church is becoming very popular in the church, including in the United States. Um, this idea that, that everybody is saved or um, non-Catholic religions are acceptable and vehicles for salvation. Um, and Father Feeney reacted um, too much. He went, he went too far by uh, his particular understanding of that phrase uh, that has been canonized throughout the years uh, in Catholic circles, and that is that there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church. So he came up with a, mm. a very um, extreme um, understanding of that, which was condemned under the pontificate of Pius the Twelfth, his his particular understanding of of that phrase, no salvation outside the church. So he's he's reacting to these errors, and he's basically taking it too far, taking the the idea of of salvation, uh, no salvation outside of the church. So he he was uh, closely tied to a to a group of people or to a center, I guess we could call it the the Saint Benedict Center, and this is going to be important in in the history of Fenianism. Is that right? Yes, yes. And I, I think it, it might be good for us just to firstly go over the history of Father Feeney and his group or his groups, we could say, um, and then consider the particular theological question that he was looking at, and how he sort of erred in that area um, and, the, and the actual teaching of the church. So Father Leonard Feeney um, was, I think he was born in 1897. Um, he was a very gifted uh, Jesuit priest. He was he was an author. He was he was a poet. Um, he published uh, various works, and he was assigned uh, by his Jesuit superiors um, to be a chaplain for what was called the Saint Benedict Center. So the Saint Benedict Center was founded by Catherine Goddard Clark <clears throat> around 1940, um, and. This was just a place for Catholic University students to gather and learn about uh, the faith. So Father Feeney, as I say, um, two years after it was founded, um, he was 
assigned to be the spiritual director of the St. Benedict Center by his Jesuit superior. Um, and then later, he, in 1945, he was given permission to work there for full time. So that was just like his whole apostolate was focused on St. Benedict Center. <clears throat> and as I say, Father Feeney was, was very gifted. He, he worked well with the university students. Um, he was very passionate about the faith. He, he was very apostolic. He would stand up in the Boston Commons. He would preach the faith. He, you know, sort of stand up on a soapbox and and um, uh, basically, you know, promote the faith and try to convert people. So, so far, so good. Um, but unfortunately, his work with the St. Benedict Center became just too particular, uh, too individualistic. And um, they started doing things without getting any permission for them whatsoever. Um, one thing that they did is they, they transformed St. Benedict Center from, from being just a, a gathering place for university students to being an actual school. Um, they didn't mm -hmm. consult the Jesuits. They didn't consult the diocese. They probably said, okay, we're, we're lay folk. We don't need the permission of the diocese. Um, and Father Feeney was very reluctant to have other Jesuits help out at St. Benedict Center. Um, and at the same time, he was he was working up this this idea that would later be called uh, Feenism. Um, he was noticing that there were, were this uh, weakening of faith um, in the Catholic world, and he thought that there was some sort of displaced doctrine, some sort of doctrine that was no longer being held as it should. Um, that would explain the doctrinal corruption that he saw around him. Um, and so he looked and looked, and, and, and in 1947, he announced that that doctrine was no salvation outside the Catholic Church, that, that this was the dogma that was somehow displaced, sort of set aside in the 1940s that was leading people um, to not have their, their faith as they should. And... Um, you know, he he started calling it, and St. Benedict started, Center started calling it the dogma. <laughs> they always oh, referred wow. to it as the dogma. You know, as if, um, yeah, the the other there's there, there's a first class dogma, and then the rest are sort of second class dogmas. Um, so they definitely focused completely on that. Like this was the solution. You know, like how Archbishop Lefebvre, his his mindset was that what I need to give to the church. Our priest in, in order to resolve the crisis. Of the church. I needed to give good priests to the church. Um, for Father Feeney, he he said, "I need to give the dogma back to the church um, and, and teach uh, people this this dogma." That's very interesting. Um, it's um, and and this is not. Correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I think we're going to dive into this in a little little bit after we talk about Feeneyism itself and Father Feeney mm -hmm. and his his story. The dogma, like you said, is a little bit odd. Church. I mean, that formula outside the church, there's no salvation. Extra ecclesiam nulla salus is a formula that has been canonized um, for, from time immemorial. Um, and there's some very strong statements to that effect, um, okay. very definitive statements. <clears throat> so it's definitely, uh, I would say, a de fide teaching of the church. However, um, what what must be understood is that that we have to believe the truths of the faith in the way that the the church teaches them. Um, what Father Feeney's problem was not that he was identifying this as something that needs to be believed. Um, it was that he was giving his own interpretation to that belief, a very rigorous okay. interpretation. Um, so that's that's really where where he deviated. Um, and <clears throat> when. You know, you, you sort of see this trajectory that Father Feeney is on that, that leads, what I would say, to disaster. Um, it, when, when he starts to isolate himself in St. Benedict Center, he, he starts to, to, to come up with this extreme idea of, of uh, no salvation outside the church, which, which as I say, what we'll cover in the second part, what, what exactly he understood that to mean. Um, and... He just goes from there. It, it just gets worse and worse from that point. Um, so in 1948, I suppose the superiors were seeing that they, this is this is not looking good. Um, and so they they transferred him to another place. He said, let's get him out of St. Benedict Center. Um, let's transfer him to Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. 
And, and you know, for the Jesuits, um, the, the question of obedience is super important for them. I think it's super important for, for all priests and, and nuns and monks. But for the Jesuits especially, they take a, an extra vow of obedience uh, to the Pope. Um, so it's definitely ingrained in them. Um, so Father Feeney went. I mean, God bless him. He, 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 he obeyed orders. He, he went to Holy Cross College. Um, but shortly thereafter, some a couple of young men from St. Benedict Center came and they said, please, please, Father, come back to the center. I mean, the, the, the St. Benedict Center is not the same without you. It's not going to survive without you. Think about all that great work that, that you were doing. Um, please come back. And so that uh, Father Feeney, we may say, uh, gave in to that temptation, and he, he went back uh, to St. Benedict Center. His superiors wrote him, and they said, please you know, return to your, your proper assignment. Um, you must. I mean, we, we're, we're binding you under holy obedience uh, to, to go back to your proper assignment. Um, and Father Feeney uh, refused. He refused each time he was asked. And then at the end of 1948, um, effectively, he was suspended um, from from hearing confessions. Um, and, and so, yes, he was he was heavily censured and he just he just kept going after that. You know, um, so it's, it's sort of a sad story in that regard, because you have a very talented priest um, who is, is kind of um, ruined to a certain degree by this disobedience. It is interesting, though, hearing that story, and, and this brings back the, the wisdom of Archbishop Lefebvre in, in setting up the society where the priests are not staying in one spot any, for any particular long period of time. Uh, you know, Father, you're going to be yes. in Denver for, you know, maybe another two years, maybe another five, um, maybe another seven, who knows, yes. but you're not there long term. And, you know, if some of your St. Isidore's parishioners come back to you, you know, after you're transferred to Kentucky or St. Mary's or wherever, you're not going to yeah. go back. I mean, because the idea is not that it, this is Father Robinson's church. It's this is this is a traditional Catholic church. This is not it, we, we're, we're trying to get away from that cult of personality. Archbishop Lefebvre was very smart in that. Yeah, it, that's it, that's exactly true. I mean, a, a priest can be at a certain place. He can be a very charismatic figure. The people become very attached to him. Um, and then slowly but surely, um, he develops the idea that that this is this is where God wants him to be, no matter what. Even yeah. if his superiors tell him that that's not where he's supposed to be, he says to himself, "No, this is this is what God wants me to do." Um, and he sort of steps outside of the line of providence at that point. And unfortunately, that's what happened to to Father Feeney. Um, Seventeen days after he was suspended, he founded um, an, an order of of monks and nuns, uh, the slaves of of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, and yeah, unlike, unlike Archbishop Lefebvre, if we want to make that comparison with, with the Archbishop, um, he did not seek permission to, to found this order. Um, he just started it from scratch, just like St. Benedict Center transitioned to be a school without, without having permission. Um, he founded his order without being, getting approved from the Jesuits, getting approved from the local bishop, from the Pope or what have you. Um, whereas for Archbishop Lefebvre, that, that was completely and utterly necessary. Like if he didn't get permission to found the Society of St. Pius X from the local bishop, he said, we're not going to do it. Um, right. So, so it, you know, and it, it was it was a very strange thing, um, this this sort of morphing of St. Benedict Center into the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, because what he was dealing with, he, he had a, a bunch of, of lay folk there who were married. And, and now he says, well, we're, we're going to become religious. Um, so the Catherine Goddard Clark, um, with the founding member of, of St. Benedict Center was there. There were, there was other married couples there. Um, and they just decided that they were going to become religious. Um, but the difficulty was, is that they, they had their own children. They, they had a family. Um, so, so what they did, and this is, this is something that's unique in the history of the church, really. I mean, as far as I know, there's no other example that's happening. Um, is, is that they decided to um, have the, the children um, raised elsewhere. Yeah, they, they sort of raised the children communally. Um, let me just quote what Gary Potter, who is sort of an apologist for St. Benedict Center, what he says in, after the Boston Heresy case. He says, the children's parents effectively ceased to exist 
as parents to the children, and more so as the child grew from three to five to 10 and older. Care was taken that the children had no direct or special contact with their parents, save on a half dozen major feast days during each year when the entire community would gather for socializing. The parents were seen by the children as scarcely more than another big brother or big sister. So, yeah, I mean, this is just sort of flabbergasting. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, like, like you said, it's, it's not Catholic at all. It's- there is one case where where St. Nicholas of Flew in, in Switzerland, where he's received a special mission from God, I mean, an inspiration from God to leave his family and um, go off and, and live in a cave um, for the benefit of, of Switzerland. Um, and, uh, you know, if Andrew, if that happens to you, I would, I would advise, you know, you get, you get a little bit of direction, but, but ultimately you, f- you follow that. I mean, if God really wants you to do that, <laughs> but, but I mean, normally speaking, um, <clears throat> we have to follow the, the path of providence through, through the external authorities. And I think for every priest, if, if we just get off on our own and start to develop our own ideas and become some sort of oracle for the lay folk, some really strange things can happen, and unfortunately, I think that's that's the case here. <clears throat> what was going on with um, the St. Benedict Center and the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary? So, um, <clears throat> after that, uh, Father Feeney was suspended. He was not just um, banned from hearing confessions, but but from saying Mass on April the eighteenth, nineteen forty nine, and the Holy Office investigated. Um, Father Feeney and um, issued a decree uh, saying that that his position on no salvation outside the church uh, was was wrong. So let me just read from this letter of the Holy Office. The Holy Office is is writing a letter to the Archbishop of Boston. The Archbishop of Boston is saying, "Hey, wh- this is what's going on in my diocese. Can you make a decision?" <clears throat> so it says, uh, "Your Excellency." This supreme sacred congregation has followed very attentively the rise and the course of the grave controversy stirred up by certain associates of St. Benedict's Center and Boston College in regards to the interpretation of that axiom, outside the church there is no salvation. After having examined all the documents that are necessary or useful in this matter, among them information from your chancery, as well as appeals and reports in which the associates of St. Benedict's Center explain their opinions and complaints, and also many other documents pertinent to the controversy officially collected, the same sacred congregation is convinced that the unfortunate controversy arose from the fact that the axiom outside the church there is no salvation was not correctly understood and weighed, and that the same controversy was rendered more bitter by serious disturbance of discipline arising from the fact that some of the associates of the institutions mentioned above refused reverence and obedient obedience to the legitimate authorities. Um, it's interesting that one of the, the signatories of this letter is um, Cardinal Ottaviani. You know, Cardinal wow. Ottaviani has appeared quite often in this Crisis in the Church series. So, so yeah. you, you've got Cardinal Ottaviani, very, very conservative, very orthodox, um, signing this letter, saying that, that basically Father Feeney has gotten this wrong. Um, the, this under, his understanding of uh, outside the church is no salvation is incorrect. And, and also that his group um, is disobedient. It's just simply in a state of rebellion. Um, and, and not surprisingly, Father Feeney referred to that letter uh, as a heretical letter. I mean, he called it a heretical letter. Um, so this, this intervention from the Holy Office, the, the, the highest decision-making body uh, with regards to doctrinal questions in Rome, um, led Father Finu just to, to double down and really harden his position. Wow. And, and again, still trying to make that comparison with, with Archbishop Lefebvre. I mean, to me, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense to be able to do that. Uh, even when Archbishop Lefebvre was having um, troubles, I guess we could say with, with, with the Vatican, when, when things were getting heated, um, when he was summoned to Rome for meetings, he still went, he went every, I mean, unless, Unless I'm missing something, from what I can recall, every single time he was asked to go to Rome to meet with the Holy Father, he went. <laughs> he, he didn't refuse yes. to go. Right, yeah. And, and the Archbishop was perfectly transparent um, in, in all of his dealings with Rome. 
So unfortunately, this is this is not what what happened with with Father Feeney because um, from from that point um, he was expelled from the Jesuits in that year, on October 10th of that year, 1949. Um, in 1952, uh, the Saint Benedict Center was put under interdict by the Church. I mean, so the. Mm. The church is just like, we, we've tried to persuade you. We, we, we've tried to speak to you. It's not working. So we're just going to have to use basically the stick. Um, so you're not allowed to, to have mass there. Um, and they responded by, by basically accusing um, Pius the, the, ten, the, the 12th and his holy office of heresy. So they sent a letter on September the 24th of 1952 to the holy office of um, and, and accused it of, of holding heresy. Um, and Pius XII, you know, I, I mean, as, as a Holy Father, um, he, he was willing to entertain that things had been misunderstood, that perhaps um, he needed to look at this more closely. And so what he did is he summoned Father Feeney to Rome, and he, and he said, come and um, let me hear your case face to face. Um, he, he did that three times. He summoned Father Feeney three times. Um, each time Father Feeney wrote a letter to Rome, uh, but did not go to Rome. Um, and so, yes, he was basically refusing to answer that summons and, and speak to the Holy Father. Um, and so he ended up being excommunicated on February the 13th, 1953. Um, and, and that kind of really closes that chapter of Father Feeney's history um, in the pontificate of Pius XII. After that, you know, nothing really happens um, with between Father Feeney and, and, and Pius XII. Um, so as I say, it's just, for me, really the whole history is marred by that spirit of disobedience and that spirit of independence. Um, and that's what led to the disaster above all other things. And and on one hand, you can you can understand a little bit where he where he's starting. From, I mean, again, I, I'm I'm maybe trying to be over overly apologetic here, but he sees problems in the church. He sees things. He wants to try to fix them. But again, he it's it's kind of a cautionary tale for traditional Catholics like us. Uh, there there is a too far. There is a too or overly traditional. Uh, that you don't want to get get down into because, um, and again, by the fruits you, we are knowing that he's he's acting out of out of pride or out of a misplaced sense of I'm the only one who can save this or or something. Yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely a cautionary tale. Um, uh, we we definitely sympathize with with Father Feeney. We, we sympathize with his followers. Uh, we hate ecumenism too. We hate this degradation of the special status of the Catholic Church, to, to put the Catholic Church on the same level as the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and so on is is very painful to see because the, the Church is the one bride of Christ. Um, and yet at the same time, to, to go off on our own and invent some new understanding of outside of the, the Church, there's no salvation, and make that um, dogma, you know, uh, even against the Pope himself, a very, a very good and orthodox Pope um, is going too far. I mean, you're going to see that later on with, with the the era of state of Acantism. I mean, the, it's the mm -hmm. same sort of thing. Um, they're just like, how can we have popes who are so bad, um, and they're looking for a solution, and they reach for a very black and white solution, um, but but one which really creates many more problems than it solves. Uh, and I, I think that's that's what happens here. You know, Father Feeding is like, okay, you know, I'm going to fix the, the Christ in the church. What I, I need to I need to find the, the solution, sort of the silver bullet. And he's like, I think I've got it. I, the silver bullet is outside the church. There's no salvation. If, if I just preach that um, as rigorously as possible, then I will solve the crisis in the church. Um, and I mean, that was his anticipation. But but what happened instead is he he found this sort of bizarre group of religious who who raise their children in common um, and uh, live live apart from their spouses and sort of switch switch gears with their whole state in life um, and, and and basically consider themselves um, fit to excommunicate Rome or tell Rome that you're in a state of heresy 
So, yeah. Yeah, not great. So this is this is where things stand uh, with with Pius the Twelfth and and Father Feeney. Um, after Pope Pius the Twelfth, though, we have John the Twenty Third, and then Pope Paul the uh, Sixth. What did did Father Feeney ever get in contact with them later? Did they ever have any interactions with Father Feeney? How did, how does the story kind of end? Yeah, well, um, there was the there was this uh, prelate of, of Boston, um, Archbishop Umberto um, Medeiros. Who I I think he he wanted to um, basically save Father Feeney save save his soul um, and so he appealed to Paul the um, Sixth to to find a way to reconcile Father Feeney with the Church and what happened was in 1972 he was able to do that he was able to reconcile Father Feeney to the Church um, but. Father Feeney was not demanded to recant his interpretation of extra ecclesia omnibus salus. So, I mean, it's it's kind of a paradoxical that Father Feeney was basically condemned under Pius XII, a very orthodox pope. And then he was reconciled under Paul VI, very liberal pope, but without ever having to um, admit that he was wrong. Um, so, I mean, we certainly hope that, that he saved his soul, um, but we, we just um, don't see that, that humbling of himself, um, unfortunately. He, he did die, and I believe it was 19, 1978. He, as they say, he was reconciled with the church. He was, he was uh, buried by uh, the bishop there in Boston. Um, so he had an ecclesiastical funeral and, and everything. Um, so, I mean, in, in a sense, that's, that's a good ending. Um, to it, but um, we, we would wish that, that he had recanted his heir before he had died. Certainly. Well, that, that's fascinating, Father, and it, it's very interesting to kind of place this mm-hmm. in the in the chronology of what we've been talking about today. And, and we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the true interpretation or the, the actual interpretation of, of uh, no, no salvation outside of the church. Um, so we're going to be doing that next episode. We're going to dive into that yeah. a little bit more, but for today... Um, I think that kind of wraps things up. So thank you very much, Father, for going into that with us. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Andrew. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you for listening to and watching episode 31 of the Crisis in the Church series here on the SSPX podcast. Coming up next time, we'll continue our discussion on the topic of Extra Ecclesiam Nola Salus, this time from a doctrinal perspective. What is it that the Church teaches on this subject? And what was the main error held by the followers of Father Feeney? And how does this doctrine relate to the current crisis in the Church? If you have a question on the topic of the crisis, please feel free to ask it at sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Please share this episode with someone who you think might enjoy it. And if they don't know what a podcast is, please show them so that they can take advantage of all our episodes. And... If you have the ability to set up a monthly recurring donation of 5 or 10 or $20 on sspxpodcast.com, it would help us immensely to complete this Crisis in the Church project. Until next week, thank you for listening, and God bless you.